So in Exodus chapter 2, of course, a very familiar passage uh, where Moses is being thrown, uh, thrown to the crocodiles there in the Nile, and Pharaoh's daughter comes along and finds him. And it says in Exodus chapter 2, verse 6, And when she had opened it, speaking of the ark, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. So it says there that when she saw Moses there, this helpless baby, crying out that she had compassion on him. And we probably all understand what compassion is, but just in case we don't, you know, compassion is basically when we have a feeling of deep sympathy, right? It's when we see somebody in a certain predicament and we say, oh, that's too bad. And we have sorrow uh, by, for others who are in bad circumstances, who are suffering misfortune. And not only that, that compassion is not only just that feeling, but it's also being it is accompanied accompanied by a strong desire to do something about it compassion is not only understanding and seeing that people are hurting but also wanting to help them to do something about it to alleviate that suffering and you can see that here with uh with uh, pharaoh's daughter i mean she's seeing this babe he's she knows what the law of the land is that all these babies are just supposed to be thrown into the river and she picks out this particular one and, and hears it and goes over to it, and compassion takes a hold of her, and she looks at this baby, and, and we know the story goes. She takes it unto herself, and, uh, you know, Moses' his sister goes and gets mom, and she nurses the baby, and when he's weaned, she go, Moses goes to live in her house as her child. But uh, what we should see from this, first of all, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into what I'm preaching here in a minute, is that compassion, you know, it's, it's more than a feeling. You know, compassion isn't just a feeling. We just see, oh, it's too bad someone's going through something. Compassion's a call to action. You know, it, it, it'd be one thing if, if uh, I mean, just imagine if, if Pharaoh's daughter had come up and seen this little baby in this ark, and, I mean, it's the River Nile. It's probably got piranhas in it or whatever else and crocodiles and just said, that's, that's really too bad. Someone should do something about that and just kind of walked away. Would you say she's a compassionate person just because she felt bad that the little poor baby Moses is going to get eaten up by a who knows what. No, she had to do something about it. She had to take that baby out of that ark and, and, and have it nursed and then brought into her house and raise it. So compassion, you know, is, is, is more than a feeling. It's a call to action. And it, here's the thing about it. You know, we might not always act on the compassion that we feel, right? But we all usually do feel compassion, unless you're some kind of a psychopath, <laughs> Right, but I'm sure that's none of us. <laughs> that's a, kind of an inside joke right now. But anyway, uh, compassion is a natural human emotion, though, isn't it? We all feel it, but do we all do something about it? You know, not always. And if you would, go over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. The Bible says in Isaiah 49, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, the Lord hath forgotten me. And then Isaiah, speaking on behalf of the Lord, to try to bring Zion to their senses, it says, can a woman forget her suckling child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Backslidden Israel is saying, the Lord's forgotten me. And he's saying, wait a minute. I'll forg can I forget you any sooner than a woman would forget her suckling child? That's the example that he's using there to try to drive that point across. A human relationship between a mother and her child. So again, it, what I'm trying to get at is that a compassion is a natural human emotion. God uses that <coughs> as an example to get across the point that he has compassion for us. He uses that human relationship. <coughs> he says, yea, they, they, may, they may forget thee, yet I will not forget thee. And what's interesting about the story with uh, Pharaoh's daughter is that Pharaoh is Pharaoh's daughter, right? She's an Egyptian. And we all know that Egyptians in the scripture are a representation of the world often of sin, right? The unsaved, the heathen. But it was Pharaoh's daughter that found Moses. It was Pharaoh's daughter who did something about it, who didn't just feel compassion, but actually took action to do something about this poor baby. <laughs> and, 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 and unfortunately today, you know, and I'm sure it can all be said of us to some degree, to one, or, at one point or another, that we've all probably been less compassionate than the world has. And if we look around the world, even the world, because it is a natural human emotion to be compassionate, often acts on it. I mean, we could just start 
thinking about the different things the world does to try and alleviate human suffering. I mean, they've got all the, you know, call this number, just five cents a day, adopt this child, so on and so forth. All the things that they do, and those are fine and good. I'm not against that. I mean, the world is so compassionate today, they, they're even worried about the poor little animals. Right? They're, they're going to set up their organizations to protect animals, and that's another sermon. The point I'm trying to make is that, you know, the world, even the lost, the heathen, the Pharaoh's daughters of this world, they feel compassion. They do something about it. And, you know, the world should not be more compassionate than us. Now, I'm not saying we have to match them in every level of, of what they're doing. Like, well, are you, Brother Corbin is saying we've got to start our own animal rights organization here at Faithful Word. That's not what I'm saying. Because we know what true compassion looks like. You know, and then, of course, not to downplay what they're doing, trying to feed people, help people. That, those are good things. I understand that. But the greatest thing we all know we can do for anybody is to see a soul saved, to preach the gospel. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, what good does it do to, to, to clothe somebody and to feed them and not preach them the gospel? And, 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 and I'm glad there's people that do that. So we don't have to. <laughs> I'm glad there's people out there that are taking care of that, that are fighting that battle. But that doesn't mean we don't have a battle to fight too. And we should never let it be said of us that the world is more compassionate than us. That the world does more to alleviate the suffering of others than we do. <clears throat> of course, again, they do it to meet physical needs. We should do it to meet their spiritual needs. And what I want to preach the message tonight very quickly is just this idea that compassion is what makes us Christians. Compassion is what makes us Christians. You know, there's probably, if we were to go around and say, oh, are you, what, what are you? Oh, I'm a Christian. We would say, oh, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? And people could probably come up with different things. Well, I'm a Christian because I believe the Bible. But is that really what makes you a Christian? That just might make you a Bible reader. Well, I'm a Christian because I put my faith in Jesus. Well, that just makes you a believer, right? But what makes you a Christian? And I'm sure there's other things we could point to and say, well, this is what makes a Christian a Christian. But I think when we see in the Scripture is, is that one of the, is of course that Jesus is who we're following. Je if we're following Jesus, that is what makes us a Christian, Right? And one of the most defining attributes of Christ is that he was very compassionate. I mean, I just don't have the time tonight to read all the passages. There's just, there, there's multitudes. And if you've read the Gospels, you know them. Just, he's had compassion on these people. He had compassion on these people. He's moved compassion here. He's, just constantly, that word compassion, being moved for people, just comes up. That's the nature of who he was. That was the thrust of his ministry, caring for others, and not just feeling compassion, but doing something about it, taking action. <clears throat> what makes us Christians is the fact that we follow Christ. Not just that we've believed on him. That, you know, and I get it. We say, oh, I'm a Christian. I believe, I, and I understand that. But when we look at Scripture, what makes a Christian a Christian is the fact that they follow Jesus Christ in his footsteps. The Bible says in Acts 11, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Not every believer. It was the disciples. right? It was the disciples that were so-called it was the disciples that were said, these are people that remind us of Jesus. These are these disciples, these ones that are living this way, that are acting this way, that are behaving in this manner. It's a lot like Jesus. Let's call them Christians. They were called that first in the Antioch. It was the disciples, not just those that believed. And I understand the word Christian today has come to mean a lot of different things. But in Scripture, that's what we see. And here in John chapter 8, Verse 31, I'll say, I want to be called a Christian. You've got to be a disciple. It's a good thing to be called a Christian. And if you're in, if you're in John, uh, John 8, I think that's where I told him to go, John 8, for thir verse 31, he said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now these are Jews that did what? They believed. They're saved. Because that's all you've got to do to be saved is believe. But he said, if you want to, it's great that you believe, but if you want to go a step further and you want to be a disciple of mine, well, you've got to continue in my word. You've got to keep my commandments. You've got to do those things which I've commanded you to do. To continue in his word, to follow in his footsteps. That's what's going to make you a Christian in the eyes of God. <clears throat> you say, well, that sounds good too. I want to be called a Christian. If that means having to be a disciple, that's what I'll do. 
And if being a disciple means I have to follow in his word and keep his commandments, I'm willing to do that too. Okay, well, Matthew chapter 8. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. The Bible says in Matthew 4, He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I want to be a Christian. I, I, okay, be a disciple. I want to be a disciple. Okay, keep his word. Follow in his footsteps. Okay, how do I do that? Be a fisher of men. That's what he said. To continue in his word, to follow in his footsteps, is to be a fisher of men. He saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Not maybe. So if somebody's not a fisher of men, if they're not a going out and trying to save souls, are they really following the way they should? The answer is no. Because this is, this is follow me, and I might make you a fisher of men, and, and, oh, and maybe you, but not you, but you over here. That's not how it works. He doesn't exclude anyone from this. He says, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. <coughs> and the fact is, you just, you can't be a well-rounded Christian. Can we really say that? That I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, exercising everything that's given to me as a Christian, as a believer? Am I, am I doing all the things that make me a good Christian if you're not a fisher of men? <clears throat> well, you certainly can't do it without compassion. But remember, compassion takes action, right? Boy, it's, I feel bad that people are going to hell. I, I feel bad that there's people out there who get saved and no one's preaching to them. That, it, it bothers me. Well, you know, that's half of compassion. You're halfway there. The other half of compassion is to go do something about it and to say, you know, I'll do something. I'll go reach that one soul. I'll go knock those doors and find that soul that will be saved. You cannot be a well-rounded Christian without compassion, and that compassion manifests itself by becoming a fisher of men, by seeking others. And again, compassion is, is a defining attribute of the Lord, isn't it? As I mentioned earlier. But again, true compassion requires action on our part. It requires action on our part. <coughs> if you look there in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 1, it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. So the posts went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all the Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the, hands, the, out of the, out of the kings of Assyria. So what's going on here is, is that Hezekiah, of course, they're being attacked by the Assyrians. And soon they're going to be attacked by the Babylonians. And he sends out the posts in verse 6. And he sends it out to Ephraim and Manasseh, the northern tribes of Israel. And he's telling them, you need to come down and turn and, 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 and uh, that they should come to the house of the Lord of Jerusalem. And he's saying, according to the command of the king, you children of Israel, turn again and the Lord God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Israel. He said, I know you're being attacked. I know you're having a hard time up there. You need to turn to the Lord God and he will turn unto you that are escaped out of, the kings, out of the hands of the king of Assyria. You know, compassion is, again, it's not just more than a feeling, it's action. And it's one of God's defining attributes. But it requires action, doesn't it? And, you know, if we turn, and he's saying, if you'll turn unto God, he'll turn unto you. Why? Because God is compassionate. But what good would have done to him to turn to God, and God saying, well, I'm compassionate, but you know what, I'm not going to turn to you. I'm not going to reach out to you, I'm not going to, make a step towards you. I'm not going to move towards you. I feel bad for you, Ephraim and Manasseh. I feel bad for you, Israel, that you're going through this, that the Assyrians are attacking you, that you're being destroyed. And I see you turning to me. I see you coming to my house and worshiping me, and I, and I feel real bad about what's going on. But, uh, you know, I just, I'm busy. <laughs> I got, I'm God. I got a lot going on. <laughs> I don't have time for this. 
whatever excuse. What if God made up some excuses why he couldn't go and reach those that were in trouble? <clears throat> but we have the insurance of God from that God will, if we are in such a predicament, if we turn to God, that he is again going to turn to us, that he will have compassion on us. But that requires action, doesn't it? If you would, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. You know, compassion has to be received by those in need of it. There's, there's action required on both parts, right? You're, we're compassionate enough. We go out. We bring the gospel. We bring them to people that we know need it. If they're not saved, they need it. And we bring it to them. We're doing our part, but you know what? Compassion requires action on their part, too. They have to uh, receive it, right? They have to receive that compassion. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 10, So the posts passed through, the posts that he sent out there, <coughs> all the messengers, passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. He sends out these messengers saying, Hey, the Assyrians are all over you. You're going down, and you need to get to Jerusalem in the house of God and turn unto God, the Lord God of Israel. <clears throat> and he sends that message out, and they say, Pfft, whatever. <laughs> Bible thumper. What are you, some kind of Jehovah Witness? <laughs> whatever they might say. They laugh them to scorn and mock them. Eh, God's not going to do anything. And that's what we find a lot, too, when we go out there. If we're moved with compassion, we do something about it. We go out there, we reach these people. We're these posts that are being sent out by the king, right? And we go out and we find these people. And a lot of times, it's just, pff, whatever. Maybe it's not a mocking, maybe it's not a scorning, but it's always, eh, I'm busy. I got too much going on right now. They reject it, just like these people. They rejected the Lord's offer of compassion. <clears throat> and I don't know that it was necessarily because they didn't believe it. Maybe they knew it. Maybe they said, yeah, you're right. I just don't want to do anything about it. Yeah, you're right. I know these Syrians are all over us. We meet some sinner. Yeah, I know. I, it's a tr I'm lost. Life's hard. Sin's having its way with me. You're right. But you know what? I don't want to do anything about it. They reject it. They mock at it. They scoff at it. They make excuses. Why? Because true compassion requires action. Not only on the part of those that are to show it, but on those that are to receive it. The person who's being shown the compassion has to take action too. God's not just going to save somebody because we, you know, went out with and felt compassionate toward them. We go there, we want them to say, and say, you know, can I show you? And God says, well, that's good enough. <laughs> I'll save them. They don't need to do anything more. No, they have to listen. They have to be, make a decision. There's action required. These, uh, you know, these northern tribes, these Ephraim and Nasi, they had to go to Jerusalem and, and get right with God. That was the message. True compassion requires action on those by those that are in need of it. He says in verse 7, And be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespass against me. Uh, I think I've got you. Oh, 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 where am I at? Second Chronicles 30, verse 7, And be not like your fathers and like your brethren. Okay, good. <laughs> you saw my notes, you'd understand. He says, don't be like them which trespassed against the Lord, a God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter in the sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. I mean, isn't that the exact same message we're telling people? Look, you need to come into the temple of God. You need to come into the ark of Jesus Christ and avoid the wrath of God. Don't be like others that have gone before you. Verse 9, For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find what? 
compassion before them that lead them captive. So they shall come again into this land. So Lord God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face away from you. <clears throat> so again, he's telling them, look, there's compassion there to be had, but you have to do your part. You are the one that, they are the ones that need to do something about it. But they're never going to have that opportunity if we also aren't moved by compassion to be like Christ and take this message to them. I mean, the offer was there, but, you know, and king, the king Hezekiah gives the order to the posts, go tell them. And the posts just go, is it really that important? Somebody else will do it. Can we just put it on the internet? <laughs> what, can we just mail it to them? Do I really have to walk all the way over there? It's hot. It's a long way. And I'm going to get there, and they're going to mock, and they're going to scoff. Yeah, a lot of them might. But you might get one every now and then that'll stop and listen. Go over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Actually, if you want to go over to Matthew 9, go there. Matthew 9. <clears throat> I was just thinking about this this last week when I was down there in Safford. This is kind of where this all came from. I mean, we're down in Safford, and it's not exactly a destination city. <laughs> There's no fine dining in, in Safford. I mean, it was, hey, don't get me wrong. It was good enough, right? We were glad to go. But people aren't flocking to southern Arizona in the little town of Safford because it's, it's got some big draw. The people there are working in mines. They're working hard. You know, they're the salt of the earth type, and I love that. But we were there. We weren't there to eat food and, and have fun, although we did, because we're Baptists. We were there to save souls. We were these posts that were sent out by a king bringing a message. And you know what? We had compassion and that we took action on it. And that doesn't mean it was easy, though. And, and I'm just here to tell you, if you say, well, I'm going to follow in the steps of Christ. I'm going to show compassion on the people. I feel bad that people are going, I'm going to do something about it. It's not, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people quit. You know, we did, I got someone saved. We had 21 salvations. I got, I got to at least take credit for one of those, me and my soul winning partner. And you know which door it was? It was the last door on the last day. <laughs> you know, but I love it when it works out like that. I love it. I, I, I just love it when it works out like that. I think God knows. He says, I know this guy right here is going to get saved. So I'm just going to make Corbin go over here first, make him walk over there, and then he's going to get lost over here. And I'm just going to make sure that's the last door he knocks because I know that guy right there will listen. <clears throat> because the next time I go out and no one's getting saved, I'll just remember, well, last time that happened, it was the last door in the last day. And that just keeps me going. That happens to me all the time. <clears throat> I ran into a bass fisherman. <laughs> I think I was telling him telling you about this brother ran into a bass fisherman and he just was one of these mockers one of these scoffers well i've read the bible for 23 years i've studied the bible i wanted to say you haven't read it once because <laughs> you i said oh okay so you and i did it nicely at first i said uh i said so you know ephesians then for by grace are you saved through faith so you know the bible teaches that we're saved by grace that it's a gift that we don't work for it well, that could be argued. Oh, okay. I'm just the post, and here's another scoffer. Here's another mark, mocker just mocking the king's message. <laughs> well, can I leave you a YouTube card? Go give it to somebody that needs it. And have a good day. We will. You know? <coughs> I could have just been like, forget it. Those people down in Safford bunch of Mormons, a bunch of roughnecks, a bunch of scoffers, a bunch of mockers. <coughs> Ran into another lady, came in, uh, didn't realize I was coming through her backyard, <laughs> but we did. And uh, she comes to the door, just looking real rough. I mean, tattoos on her face, tattoos all over, just life looked like it had been hard 
kids that are probably not hers, probably grandkids. Maybe she's raising them. A lot of times that's how it goes these days. <clears throat> and you know what? I felt compassion. I said, I really want this lady to get saved. That's why I came here. You know, the bass fisherman, you know, I came for him too, but too bad for him. Someone else, maybe it's just not his day. This lady, ah, she's going to get it because she just looks like she's ready to receive it. No, <laughs> she wasn't ready either. She was busy cooking. I had the compassion, and she might even felt like, oh, he's right. Oh, this is what I, I don't know what she felt, but she had to take action too. It wasn't just enough for me to be there. She had to feel that compassion too. <clears throat> then I met Brendan at the end, my last door. Young man, little baby, brand, just a little newborn. And he came to the door, Catholic, and gave him the whole gospel. He was getting it, he was getting it. And I said, Brandon, at the very end, hey, I got a couple questions for you. First one's real easy. We're all sinners, right? Yeah, you already admitted that, huh? But Brandon, this next question I'm going to ask you, it's not hard to understand, it's hard to admit. Brandon, you, are you, can you admit that because you're a sinner, you deserve to go to hell? And he said, no, no, I don't deserve to go to hell. And I just said, why not? And I just stood there and let him think about that. <laughs> why not? And, uh, you know, you could see it build up. It got a little misty. <laughs> and I said, it's hard to admit, isn't it? Yeah. And he couldn't say anything. He just went, so you deserve to go to hell? Is that what the Bible says? And, uh, after that, I decided to get a little more lighthearted. <laughs> I said, hey, you don't have to go, buddy. <laughs> don't feel so bad. That's why I'm here. And he got saved, you know. He got it all the way. Well, that was the last door after some people that just wanted to mock and scoff or just didn't want to hear it or too busy. But there was one guy there who wanted to hear it, and he got saved. But he had to take action, didn't he? He had to realize, wow, this is compassion coming to my door today. I see the compassion of Christ, and I need to do something about it, right? He had to do something. But he never would have had that opportunity if I hadn't felt that compassion. And there's people out there in this town and all over this state that will not get saved unless we bring them the gospel. You say, boy, you guys talk about a lot here. You talk about soul winning a lot here. That's the way it is around here. <laughs> and that's the way it's going to stay. And it's a subject I never get tired of talking about. And it's something I never get tired of doing. I don't say it's, I'm not saying it never gets hard. I'm not saying it never, it's, it's always easy. But I'm saying it's always worth it. But it takes compassion. You know, maybe you're someone here that's been soul winning a long time. Maybe you're someone here that goes a lot and you just kind of feel like, well, I know it's just what I'm supposed to do. And it is. But don't ever lose that compassion for these lost people. Because it's compassion that makes us Christians. The compassion. Not just, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be the disciple to be the Christian. And if you're going to be the disciple, you have to follow in the steps. And if you're going to follow in the steps, you're going to be a, a fisher of men. And if you're going to be a fisher of men, you're going to want to have some compassion. You're going to have to show compassion. <clears throat> You're there in Matthew 9, right? Verse 35. And it says, And Jesus went about all the city and villages. Boy, that sounds like a good example. Why do you guys go to these small towns? Why don't you just knock your area code? Why don't you just say in the, you know, the immediate city limits of Tucson and just say that's good enough? Well, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. <coughs> So he's doing all this great work to in verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, right? Why were they fainted? They've been walking. They haven't had anything to eat. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, let's set up a food bank. Let's get some donations in here. Give these people some food. Clothe them. Look, I'm not against that. And I'm glad, like I said, I'm glad that there's churches 
that are doing that, other organizations that are doing that, and, I'm, and they're not even trying to preach the gospel, and, and I'm glad for that because they've got the wrong one often. So just keep them busy doing that. <laughs> you know, that's good. Just keep doing that. It's like that down at Safford. That I don't know if anyone knows it, but have you ever heard about that Vatican Observatory? Lucifer? That's the acronym, Lucifer. <laughs> it's crazy. Can you read what that means? They really, you look, that didn't just happen. You read what that actual full name is, and it's like, <clears throat> that's not an accident. Oh, it turns out it spells Lucifer, right? Anyway, but what are they doing with that thing? They're literally looking for extraterrestrial life or something like that in hopes that they can give them the gospel or something like that. Someone's like, yeah, the Pope said that he's open to giving aliens the gospel. And I thought, that's a real good job for the Catholic Church. <laughs> Let's encourage them. You know what? You keep looking. Why don't you just keep looking out there? We'll take care of everything down here. Because they got the false gospel, right? And, I, and again, I, Jesus here, you know, he's not setting up the food bank. Let, let other people do that. They're going to do that. Compassion's a natural human emotion. People are going to fight that battle for us. But the battle they're not going to fight is the battle for the, the lost. They're not going to fight that battle. They can't. They're lost often. He says, He was moved on compassion on them. And it says in verse 37, Then said he, saith any of his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now that's an interesting response, isn't it? We've read this so many times. We've heard it preached. But he's moved with compassion on this multitude of people that are there. And you think, oh, he's going to do a miracle. Oh, he's going to do some great thing. And you'd think the Bible would read, oh, now he's going to go over there and take care of all their needs and just and, and, and do this wonderful miracle, and it's going to be great. And when he's moved with compassion, look what he does. He turns to his disciples and says, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's what Jesus was moved to do when he felt compassion upon the multitudes. When he looked at that throng out there, faint, weak, desperate, he said, we need more laborers. We need more people to go into the field and, and go into the harvest. We need laborers for the work. <clears throat> that's what his compassion, that's how it manifested itself. A call to action. Not just him taking action, and we know he took plenty of action. But when he felt it, he put out, his compassion moved him to put out a call to action for us. To preach the gospel to every creature, to all of them, to everybody. <clears throat> and that's, you know, a message that's being delivered to us. That's the call to us. We want to pray that prayer. That's probably, actually, you know what? That's probably the least prayed prayer that we're told to pray, isn't it? He said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest. He said, you need to ask for laborers. I wonder how often that really gets prayed. Because you can't really pray that prayer if you're not doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's hard to tell, ask people to do things that you are not doing. Right? People are going to help me move, and I'm going to say, just get those boxes. They're going to look at you and go, what are you doing? <laughs> They're going to look at me and say that, right? If I'm picking up, hey, can you get that other box? You know, then they'll go get the box. Oh, I need it. We're, we're praying. We're in our place closet. Oh, i got to pray for that. <clears throat> pray for a laborers to go and harvest. And God's like, what's that? You know, the laborers going to harvest. Huh? <laughs> well, what are you doing? Oh, I think I just found one. You wanted a laborer to go to the harvest? How about you? We don't pray that prayer, I think. I don't know. The ones that do are probably the ones that are already out there doing it. They're out there going, man, there's so many more people that we need to reach. We, we, we're putting a dent in this thing. We're just, it's like we're standing against the floodwaters just doing this and everybody else is just flying by us. Going to hell. <laughs> So I guess I'll just close by saying this. You know, the Bible says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's a great promise for the soul winner, isn't it? 
But, you know, it, it's the sowing in tears, right? It's the compassion that's there. You know, maybe we've never even begun to go down. Maybe we've never even entered into that harvest. Well, we probably don't, you know, really, this really isn't really something that we worry too much about then. We probably, maybe we, we read that and go, yeah, I don't know. Does that really apply to me? I don't have to worry about sowing in tears. I don't sow at all. We need to sow, and, it, and those of us that are sowing, maybe, maybe the eye's gotten a little dry out there, and not just because it's hot and windy. Maybe it's just because we lost the compassion. Maybe we find ourselves at the door getting a little curt. Maybe we find ourselves at the door being a little, well, dare I say, rude. <laughs> or just maybe like, <laughs> I'm out here, I'm in the labor, I'm, I'm in the harvest. Well, you know, that's, I'm trying to help tonight. You know, I'm trying to help with that. And we need to, we need to get the, the tears back in, the, in there. And then we'll reap with joy. <laughs> he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seeds. Uh, I'm going forth and I have the seed, but are we, do we have the weeping? Do we have the compassion for what we're doing? Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. If we've lost our passion soul winning, or if we've never had it, it may be because we've lost our compassion for the lost. And I just want to remind us tonight that compassion is a defining attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's one thing, you, if you could really describe them in one word, that would probably be a good word to use, wouldn't it? Compassion on the lost, compassion on me and you. <coughs> and we need to be like him. We need to have compassion. Let's go ahead and pray.